Good morning, church. Hope you guys are doing well today. Um, if you're a first-time guest, we are so glad you're here. We're glad that you came and are a part of Spotswood at Lady Smith this morning. If you have not, make sure you take time to fill out a first-time guest card. We have a gift for you. We want to say thank you for being here. It's another opportunity to take that. We give a little mug in that. And uh, regardless if you come back or not, we'd love for you to be here, but we would love for you to uh, be a part of what we're doing here. We know Spotswood at Lady Smith is not for everyone, but we know we're a church plant. We are trying to reach the the Caroline County, and our, our vision is we exist to glorify God by advancing His kingdom through obedience to His great commission. And so we're, that is who we are, and that's going to take a lot of hard work. Everybody, we say everybody has to be in, in the field, no fans in the stands. Uh, you're a coach, you're a player, you're a trainer, you're something, but you're on the field working hard to advance God's kingdom. But if you'll take that and that little mug that we put in there, make sure you pray for us daily. Uh, weekly, whatever you can do, uh, pray for us because we, we need Lord's prayers. But God has been gracious to us. Uh, we, I just met with the school this week. You know that we partnered a lot with our school here and also the other elementary schools. But just this week, I met with the principal and the counselor, and they just laid out the calendar and said, hey, how can we partner? And so it's been a beautiful relationship. And so you'll hear in the wait, weeks and uh, months ahead about what we're going to be trying to do to partner more. You guys know that last year we helped out at Christmas time and we help with Teacher Appreciation Week and all those different things that we want to do. But we want to be as involved as we can in the life of the school because we know in the life of the school represents individual kids and families that need to be ministered to and loved and shown the love of Christ. So that's, that's what we're doing. So realize that. Also, if you haven't, sign up to bring some food on September 9th because it's our birthday. So we're excited about that. Uh, September 9th is our Spotswood at Ladysmith birthday party. Please come, invite friends. Uh, you don't have to be coming for so many weeks. Show up, invite friends, whatever we can do. We're going to be doing uh, pulled pork. We'll provide all that. We'll provide a, uh, quite a bit of the food. Uh, we're going to be doing inflatables for the kids, like an obstacle course and some other things, cornhole, non-square. If you don't know what that is, I promise you it'll be a lot of fun and you'll have an exciting time. And we're actually going to be doing it right at the fairgrounds, right down the road here on Route 1. And that door will open at 1130 shortly after our service ends here. And then we'll start eating around 1215. But if you haven't signed up to bring something, please do that. Uh, or you can see one of the guys in, uh, or one of the ladies in shirts. And if you got a favorite, we'll sign you up. If you can't do the electronic thing, we'll help you out any way we can to do that. If you will, turn to Psalm 90. Uh, Psalm 90 was the psalm that Matt read earlier. So thankful for our team and all that uh, God is doing uh, through our team here. I appreciate Matt reading the word uh, to us this morning. I'm going to focus really on one text or one verse in that text today, and it's really going to be what I build the sermon around. And then, of course, the before and after are very applicable to that. But the verse is this, 90, uh, Psalm 90, verse 12, says this, So teach us to number our days that we may get a heart of wisdom. Teach us, so teach us to number our days so that we may get a heart of wisdom. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for this day. God, we, as James says, whoever lacks wisdom, come, humble themselves and ask, and you will give. And so, Father, we ask for wisdom today. We desperately need it. We need it to, to live our life uh, as a son or daughter of yours. We need it to be a mom or a dad or a brother or a daughter, a brother or son um, or a daughter or whatever it may be, uh, an aunt, an uncle, uh, a co-worker, um, a neighbor, a teammate, God, to, to demonstrate and portray um, who you are. We need, to, we need your wisdom, Father. Uh, we need to be filled with the power of your Holy Spirit. But God, we need wisdom to make decisions that will bring glory to you and be for our good. Uh, Father, I pray as we step through this text this morning, God, that you would speak very clearly to the hearts and minds of individuals. God, do what only you can do, and that's to change eternally in the hearts of mine. God, plant seeds. God, I pray that I will water, and God, I pray that you will give the increase. God, we need you. In Jesus' name, amen. If you read uh, this, this is the only known psalm that we have written by Moses. It's a prayer. It's really cool at the beginning. I love that line. A prayer of Moses, 
the man of God. That's a great title, isn't it? Uh, if you're going to have a title, if your title is man of God or woman of God, that's a great title to have. And we see that right here. Now, what we see in this text is the first 11 verses, it, it, it carries this kind of theme or feeling about it. In verse 12, there's a kind of a pivot moment because that whole, that whole verse kind of changes the direction of the prayer. But the first part, the first 11, is really summed up in this idea that we're, we're finite, I mean, we're limited, we're temporal, okay? Uh, we're, we're here today and gone tomorrow. We're, we're like a vapor, the proverb says, and, and James says our life, but a, sh- a short time here. And, and so we're, we're finite. And it also is very clear that we're broken, right? We're messed up. We, we're trying to create a place in, in Spotswood at Lady Smith where it's okay not to be okay. We're, we're all broken here. We all on different stages of God uh, sanctifying us and redeeming us and wooing him to his self. But this idea that it's okay not to be okay, it's just not okay to stay there. God wants to draw us closer to him each and every day. And just like as we talked last week, if I'm the same I am spiritually uh, five years from now than I am today, I'm not progressing. God's not asking... For perfection, that's why Jesus had to die. He's, he's looking for progression, right? To progress toward him, to, to walk daily toward him. And so this idea that, this also is this idea that we can't fix ourselves. Uh, Moses is very clear that we cannot clean ourselves up. We're, we're undone, as Isaiah would say. We're, we're a people of unclean lips. I'm an individual of unclean lips. Woe is me. This is this idea of what Moses is saying here. But it's that verse 12 where he says, so teach us to number our days that we may get wisdom, a heart of wisdom. And we just talked about this. If you haven't, uh, wasn't here for our James series, go back and look at that. You can go to YouTube and just type in uh, Spotswood at Ladysmith or go to our webpage. And if you're here for the first time, you want to go back and hear about who we are, go back to the very beginning and watch our vision and value series and you can hear the heart of who we are. But it's this idea of two different types of wisdom. There's only one or two different types. There's the world's wisdom which is all about me, myself, and I, right? And then there's godly wisdom, where God is the center of our universe, uh, not the earth, the sun, um, and not the sun itself, but the son of God, Jesus Christ, right? We, we need to understand that our world revolves around God, and that the, the, the book, um, Purpose Driven Life, said it in the very first part of the title. It says, life is not about you, it's about God. And that's what... That's what uh, Moses is saying here. He's saying, teach us to number our days so we may get a heart of wisdom. We we see through the book of Proverbs, there's three words that's used over and over and over again. One is this idea of knowledge. The other one's understanding. The last one's wisdom. So it's not just good enough to have knowledge. It's not just good enough to have understanding, but God ultimately wants us to have wisdom. That's this working knowledge and understanding working together over time that God wants us not just to hear his word and know his word, not just to believe it, but he wants us to obey it, right? So understanding is it's our head working with our heart, working with our hands. So it's this idea of knowing God's word, uh, believing God's word, having faith in it, and obeying God's word. This is what Moses is talking about. And then he goes on to kind of really summarize the other half of this prayer is this idea that God is good, God is gracious, and God is generous. So, so how do we know that? See, you've got to step back and see that Moses walked with God. I mean, Moses experienced God. I mean, we're, we're talking about a man who, who fled after he mu- uh, murdered an Israelite. Then he had this experience with God of the burning bush, bush and was asked to go back and lead his people to freedom. And we see God use him in a mighty way through the plagues in, um, in Egypt to eventually release. And we see the whole army of the Egyptians get swallowed up in the Red Sea. And they understand that Moses experienced all these things. He went into, he went into uh, the desert and where at the beginning uh, God provided manna and then he would lead them by a pillar of at night in a, a cloud by daytime and, and bring water out of the rocks right in the desert. And then we see him go on Mount Sinai and have this experience. I, I shared with you guys last week that he got caught in a storm uh, on the James River last 
a Friday in the middle of a little fishing trip. And I mean, I'm talking about lightning across the sky, just down probably 100 or less yards from us. And I imagine what Mount Sinai must have sounded like uh, to Moses with this peeling and thunder and crack and lightning. I mean, imagine the, the shock and awe, if you will, of what Moses must have felt during that moment, right? So we need to understand that Moses comes into this prayer experiencing God. We, we even see where he experienced his own people being swallowed up in the desert because of their rebellion and stiff-neckedness toward God. And so we see Moses walking with God because he saw that God was good and gracious and generous. How do we know that? Well, instead of us trying to bullet point who God is and put these character traits on God, why don't we read for ourselves what God says about our, himself? So if you will, turn to Exodus, Exodus 34. And this is what God says about himself. Exodus 34, 6 through 7. The Lord passes before him and proclaim, The Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for the thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, but who by no means clear the guilty. Listen, we've got to understand this, that God, is, as we just sang, is a good father. He's gracious. He's generous. He's kind. He's slow to anger. He's patient with us. You look at over and over and over all through the Old Testament where God would just let the Israelites rebel and give over to their own sin and then they were getting this predicament and they, they realized we've, re, we've rebelled and they repent and God would go and woo them back and bring them back and deliver them again. It's just this back and forth we see. But we need to understand that when Moses is talking about number in our days, we need to understand that time is a gift. Time's a gift. And it is a gift from God. And so we not waste our time here on earth. I, when I think of back about my life so far, one of the things um, that kind of trembles me is the idea of some of the things that I've wasted time on and how those things are going to be like hay and stubble they're not going to last for eternity. And so when he talks about number in our days, I, I think we need to understand what, what Moses is really saying here is this idea of humility, because we need to understand we're, we're, we're finite, we're limited, we're, we're going to return to dust, our body is, our soul is going to live forever, either in heaven or hell. But also that we desperately need help from God. We must humble ourselves and repent and ask God for help. And so I'm going to kind of unpack this more, but I want you to hang in there with me because I know some of you guys are not parents here today. You don't have kids, okay? Or maybe your kids are grown up. So we're going to be talking a lot about what the family looks like and what the church looks like. But I want you to understand, if you're an individual here today, you're single or single again or, or whatever the case, a widow or a widower, whatever the situation is, you have people in your life, and if you apply these principles in your life as an individual and through the body, these things will still bring forth fruit. So I, I want to remind us today that time is ticking. Huh. The opportunity to make history as a family every week. Listen, the goal for us as individuals within a family is not to leave your family with an inheritance, but a legacy, a godly legacy. And so I've got these jars up here today to remind us of a few things. Each marble in this, these are a little bit smaller than normal marbles, represents a week. So if we open this up, this represents the life of the child at birth until they turn 18 or graduate from high school. And so there are 936 weeks in a kid's life from the time of birth to the time they graduate from high school. For uh, a five-year-old, there are 676 weeks. 
For a 10-year-old, there's 416 weeks. For a 15-year-old, there's 156. And the last one I can do without looking. The 17-year-old has 52 weeks. So I want you to think about this idea of time. This idea that every week in the life of a person matters. If you will, we have 168 hours in a week. And so what we do with that time is really, really important. And this is what Moses is saying. If, if you, read, you ever read the book of Ecclesiastes, which, which was written by Solomon, Solomon could have had anything that God would grant him. And he asked for one thing was wisdom. And then you look at that whole book of Ecclesiastes, and it talks about all the things that, that Solomon got, right? He got riches, and he got power, and he got things. And he said, everything is vanity in the end, didn't he? He said, the only thing that matters is to fear God and keep his commandments. So I want you to understand that when Moses was walking with God and, and, and wrote this prayer, he had experience with God to the point where he realized this, that he had become a messenger for the people. In other words, he was to shine light on the way that God was speaking to his people. And he was to shine the light of the way, so to speak. Okay? And that the family was absolutely instrumental in God's plan for leading his people to the promised land. The family was absolutely essential. So I'm going to give you this little formula today, and I want you to write this down. Outside opposition plus divine calling plus limited time equals sustained urgency. Outside opposition plus divine calling, plus limited time, equals sustained urgency. We need to have an urgency about our life and about the kingdom of God. I'm not talking about a fright. I'm not, I'm not talking about fear. I'm not talking about irritable. Okay, I'm talking about there needs to be a sense of urgency because time is short. Our life is short. And we need to be about the things of God. We need to be leading our family in the ways of God. And so when we see this, we need to understand that we have outside opposition. Uh, 2 Corinthians 4.4 4 talks about this, that the God of this age has blinded the, the eyes of the unbelievers, right? And so we need to pray that those bl blinders would be removed and that the God of this age, for some reason, God has given him authority for a season. So we have, an oppos we have opposition. We have the ways of the world. We have Satan and demonic forces. We have even our own flesh at times that fights against us. But we have a divine calling. God doesn't want anyone to perish, but all come to repentance. So if you're not here today, you can start that relationship with him today. But those who are believers have divine calling is to make disciples. And we have limited time, which means we need to have an urgency about this call. So every week counts. We need to understand that small deposits added up over time matter. See, we as those who are leading families, and I, I want to be careful because... The reality is, in every family, is slightly different. And what I mean by that, mother and father, obviously, is the way God planned it. But do you realize that only about 30%, okay, of the families today live with their biological parents? So what I mean by that is adoptions or blended families or domestic situations where they have to live with their grandparents, whatever the situation is, okay? And God invites all those families to participate in this Okay, so understanding when we talk about this, when we talk about this idea of the family, God is inviting the families to, to live out what God has planned for them. So we need to keep a 30,000 foot view. And what I mean by that is many times we get caught up in the moment, right? Our kids are, are, are cranky or, or they're, they're being irritating or whatever that might be. But we need to begin to see, just like a, you would see a two-year-old as they begin to walk toward the steps and they're at the top and there's no gate and you see, oh, they're anticipating going down head first down the steps and you need to anticipate that. The same is true in overall life. We need to begin to see patterns of behavior in our kids' lives and their attitudes and where they're going so we can begin to shape their lives in a way that God would have us shape them. You need to understand that God has given us time with our kids because there's a certain thing in their lives that can only be accomplished over time. See, 
See, we want instant everything, and this is true of me, it's true of you, but we need to understand raising kids, raising godly kids takes time. So, so what, how does this work? We understand the cultural mandate that God created man and woman to multiply, right? To, to subdue the earth, to cultivate it. So to basically reproduce image bearers. Because before the fall, they were in the very image of God and they were without sin. So we need to we produce. But also that same is true of the Great Commission. We're to, if you will, reproduce image bearers. We're to reproduce disciples of Christ. And so just like in the cultural mandate was called to bring light into darkness like God created and, and, and order from uh, to, to chaos into things that weren't fruitful to make fruitful. That's the same us as disciple makers, but also as parents. So there's two big combined influence that God uses. And one is the family and the church. God's ordained both of them. He ordained the family first. He ordained the church next. So those two combined influences in a child life are more powerful than just two influences independently. So understand it's not an either or, it's a both and. We need to understand today, if you're a parent, you're a grandparent raising kids, a single parent, you are the main discipler of your kids. Okay? If you're an individual, do you realize you're responsible for discipleship? In other words, if you haven't been discipled, you want to be discipled, it's your responsibility to get into God's Word. It's your responsibility to, to begin to pray. It's your responsibility to begin looking for someone who can come along your side and help you okay? grow. It's also the church is a partnership together. So let me share the big idea. The big idea today is this. God ordained the family and the church to work together to demonstrate his redemptive story of mankind in each generation. Listen, it's not just an idea to pursue when we have time. It's absolutely vital for a child's relationship with God. Studies show somewhere between 50 and 80% of kids are walking away from their faith. Someone need, something needs to change. That change is the church and parents getting on the same page to raise up a generation of disciples of Christ. So what's the family's role? I, I want us to think about if we're leading families today, what's really going to matter in 100 years? Some of you are grandparents in the room. You have great influence over your grandkids. You get to do everything that you didn't get to do as a parent and then send them back. So you get to spoil them, right, to death. And then you get to... But think about that God has strategically put you as a grandparent to make a difference in that kid's life. And you may, you may be frustrated with how um, your, your, your kid, uh, your son or daughter are raising. Guess what? You have the ability to influence. I know Michelle and I even feel a weight toward nieces and nephews that maybe weren't raised in the faith. And we feel, we feel a weight to, to make sure that we're always trying to somehow plant the seed of the gospel and what God is about. So the role of the family is this. We need to understand this. Nothing is more important than someone's relationship with God. It's the most important thing, okay? We also need to understand this. No one has more potential to influence a child's relationship with God than a parent. Think about that. The parent is still the number one influencer in a kid's life, bar none. Even with the breakdown of homes today, even with the uh, drug ravish areas of our country, um, even with things that have changed in the last 75 to 100 years in our country when it comes to the kind of the nucleus of the family, the, kid, the parents are still the number one influence. In fact, fathers, 93% of students will follow the spiritual direction of their dads. 93%. Now I want you to understand this. Some of the best men I know and the best fathers I know either did not have a dad or had a horrible example for a dad. So that's no excuse, okay? But understand this. Spiritual fa fathers have a huge spiritual role to play in the life of their kids. The other thing I want you to understand is this, what, what I call the 3040 principle. In the life of a kid, 
I mean, I'm sorry, in the year of a kid, the church has about 40 hours a year. Okay? About 40 hours a year. I was a student pastor for 20 plus years, about 25. Okay? And I can tell you this, I tried to always make an impact when I was with students. And if they went through events, you know, over a week period or maybe a weekend, that may raise a little bit. But on average, they wouldn't come every week, sick, family vacations, you know, switching back between families, whatever the situation is, about 40 hours. Do you realize that same family has about 3,000 in a year? So what we're saying is this. What happens in the home is just or more important than what happens here. See? And so we need to understand the home is the place, it is the original small group or community group that God designed for people to be discipled. And so you need to understand that God has a role for the family. One of the things that I think we need to make sure that we're teaching in our homes, uh, not just teaching, but uh, this idea of catching, if you will, because I, I believe that the gospel and God's design for our lives is more caught than taught. I mean, we, we, need to, we need to talk about it, but we need to live it out. We need to demonstrate it. But this idea that every child is made in the very image of God. See, there are many theologians that believe if we will return to the all of God and realize the incredible, who God, how incredible God is and understand how holy he is and the fact that he still loves us and cares for us, that they, there will literally be an awakening because we will begin to grip and understand the true image of God. And so every God, I'm sorry, every kid is made in the image of God. We need to really communicate that to our kids, that they are made in the very image of God. And because they're made in the very image of God, they have value and worth. And that God desires to have a relationship. In other words, we need to communicate to our kids. They were born to be reproducers of the image of God that lives in them. Okay? Now, we know they're bent towards sin, so they have to be redeemed and bought back. But they're still image bearers. In other words, we were made to reflect God, but now we, we rival and rebel against God. Right? So when we're born again, we're given his spirit, and now we can truly become fully alive. This is what God is calling us to do, to, to realize that we need to teach every kid that they are made in the very image of God. And listen, when that happens, their perspective on making decisions, their perspective on view of sex and sexuality, their use of technology, how they relate to parents and authority, how they see the church, how they care about people, how they ultimately trust God, will radically change because they will begin to grip and understand who God is. It goes back to what we just talked about in Exodus, right? That God is slow to anger. He is patient. He is love. He is kind of, he's a good father and you can count on. Listen, anytime I ever doubt God, my mind always goes to the cross. It always goes to that day when God laid down his life for me and for you. And so understand, made in the very image of God. In fact, it will change our whole perspective on life because the reality is if you look at every injustice in the world, somehow a false image of God is tied to it. Think about it. Think about any injustice that happens in the world. It, there's idolatry tied to it. There's some false view of God, even if it means we're making ourselves a God and to make life, make decisions on life or death. So every injustice in the world is somehow tied to a false view of God. So we need to know God. We need to know the God of the Bible. And in turn, we need to teach our kids that they are image bearers of the living God and invite them in a relationship. Now, what's really cool is when you read through Moses, we see Moses, um, he led his, his people through this, and he also challenged them, or if you will, he charged them with this command. So if you want, want to turn over to Deuteronomy 6 and understand that God calls his, his, Moses called the families 
to create what, he, what would be described as a rhythm in life to show them that they're made in the very image of God. So Deuteronomy 6, 4 through 9. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. And these words I've commanded you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children and talk and shall talk of them. You sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise up, you shall bind them as a sign on your hand and they shall be as a frontlets between your eyes and you shall write them on the doorpost of your house and your gates. Now, this is a rhythm in life. We as a church have tried to create kind of a rhythm with our community groups because we know during the summer people vacation, they go away, uh, they're really inconsistent in their schedule. So we kind of let our small groups kind of go during the summer. They can still meet if they want or gather and do different stuff, but we're just saying that's not a primary time for that. Primary time is kind of the school year, right? And so we go through the cycle of the school year and then we'll do one little group after spring break to kind of end out the summer and that's the cycle. So we're, we're saying that because we believe there's rhythms and cycles in life and throughout the year. And the same is true as what uh, God was really trying to command his people to understand that there's rhythms in life and a daily schedule. So what I want to do is I want to share with you these kind of four rhythm areas. And I just want to share some practical ideas to you. Okay, These are things about five or six years ago I felt very convicted that I did not have a handle I wasn't being intentional with my time. And Michelle and I both talked about it. We're, we're both, if you will, self-employed. I'm a pastor. She's a realtor. And so we're always coming and going. We have to be very, super diligent. Believe me, she's a lot better at this than I am. Okay, I'm just trying to be a better listener and follower. I'm not always that good at times. But I, I know this is really important. The first rhythm, if you will, is this idea of morning times, when you wake up, right? So this is what I, I want you to write down if you... If you're taking notes, encourage words at that morning to get a sense of value and instill purpose in them. One of the things my wife does really good in the mornings is, one, she usually always provides a hot breakfast, which is amazing. Uh, but she also does this little girl gap thing with our two girls. We have a, a 10-year-old, soon to be a 9-year-old. And so they just, they just do this little girl gap. It's a little page, one little page devotional. It just talks about something out of scripture and gives them little discussion questions. And we're doing it while we're eating, right? And I don't always join them, but she's definitely doing it every, every morning. And so it's always kind of interesting when she has to be out early that morning. I do Girl Gab, which is kind of awkward, but uh, it, it happens, right? And so we do that. And, you know, one of the things that we always do before we leave the house every morning. Now, it may not be possible. I know many of you get up when it's dark and you come home when it's dark. But maybe, uh, we'll talk about this, hopefully you're home before your kids go to bed, but it's this idea that there's rhythm, rhythms, praying for your kids. I, I've got to hurry, guys, because I, I want to nail this down and I want to freak the kids' workers out, so I know I've got a lot to cover here. Um, the second thing is this idea of mealtime. So the first one is the morning time, the mealtime. We set it when you set it home. And so when you set it home, it can be mealtime, but it also can be just a time of hanging out, right? Uh, playing cards or, or whatever it may be, maybe watching a movie night, okay? So it, basically what you want to do is you want to focus your discussion on really trying to establish maybe some core values as a family. And we talked about, you know, them understanding they're made in the very image of God or other things uh, about character that you want to really emphasize in life. And th let me tell you some of the things that we've done. We, we started this thing, what we call date nights. Now, it's going to have to change because our kids are testing a lot now in the grade school, and so they're test on Fridays. And we used to do date, date nights on Thursdays and didn't work because I'm keeping them out a little bit later and not getting tests. And so a few low test scores, we're, we're switching that now. So we're doing that on Fridays. But this is how it works. It used to be first Thursday with Michelle's date night. Second Thursday was Hope's date night. Third Thursday was Emmy's date night. And then the last one was just a, uh, a family night. Just a time to get together, watch a, a fun movie, just have some downtime together. Uh, one of the other two things that I do, and many of you I've given you this as a gift, especially if you shared with me as a father or a mother that you want to be a better parent, I've given you a book called The, the Action Bible. It's the top 200 stories out of the Bible. 
is written in comic form. It's, it's accurate to scripture. It just has fictitious dialogue in it. And it's a great book. Because I was reading the Bible to my kids, and they were just staring at me like this, right? Uh, but when I began to read the action Bible, they began to see it illustrated. And by the way, this is biblical because if you look at Jesus, he taught in parables all the time. That's all he did was tell stories about the kingdom of God, right? Um, and you look in the Old Testament, even though they had the written word, a big part of telling the story was storying, okay? So understanding this is kind of goes hand in hand. They ask all kinds of crazy questions like, why did God put the tree of good and evil uh, in the garden? And I'm like, great question. Can I, get you, can I get back with you on that one? I mean, they have great questions. So understanding that that's important. We also use a, a little tool called the Bible Project. If you're, you're on the internet, just type in Bible Project. It'll come up. It's on YouTube. They've got incredible... In fact, I showed it here one time, I think, uh, when we were doing the book of Luke, and I showed how uh, they story through the book of Luke. And again, it's a great, great tool to get them to talk about this. And then the third thing is this, or this third rhythm is drive times, when you walk along the road. Now, what we talk about this is looking to do significant things. I love this uh, Trace Atkins song, and it says this. And she, and she thinks we're just fishing on the riverside, throwing back what we could fry, drowning worms and killing time, nothing too ambitious. She ain't even thinking about what's really going on here right now. But I guarantee you, this memory's a big one. She, she thinks we're just fishing. You know, just spend time with your kids. Just do something they like to do. You know, um, I'm guilty of this. When I go fishing, I get too serious, right? And I want to catch a fish, right? Uh, but when I take them, I need to be the focus on them. I got one that really loves that. I got one that doesn't really like it. So I got to find another avenue that, that, they, that they like. And I know uh, just pre- pretty much jumping on the trampoline and being crazy uh, probably fills that bill uh, for the second one. But it's this, new, this other rhythm. The, the fourth rhythm is this idea of bedtime, when you lie down. And this is where my wife, again, she's really, really good at this area. And she, she's taught me so much about how those times are probably the most sacred times where those conversations happen. You begin to really hear the heart of your kid. And, and I will say this, if you've never read the book uh, Love Languages uh, for Kids or Love Languages, period, because if you're, you're going to get married one day, if you've been married or you, you want to get married, that's a great, or even in relationships as friends, it's a great way to learn. Usually other people speak the language that they, ha- they want to receive. Um, so I know one of our daughters is really um, time. And so if you give her time, the first 30 minutes or so is kind of quiet. And then after that, it's like a floodgate, right? And those, that pillow talk, if you will, at night, there's something that happens during that time. Kids start opening up. So sometimes we've got to just put aside. And, and let me tell you something. I, I've read several books and skimmed over several books for preparation with this on, on top of reading Scripture. And there are some things about cell phones that are kind of scary right now, to be honest. Um, and cell phones are changing us. Uh, now, I, I love technology. I've got laptops. I've had iPads. I've got an iPhone. But the, but the reality is they're very distracting. And we, as individuals, need to learn to take breaks off them. We, we need to somehow be able to unplug. Just go and look next time you're at a restaurant and look around at the tables when everyone's looking at their phone and no one's talking to each other, right? And so this idea to understand there needs to be a time where we just slow down and we begin to listen to our kids. In fact, I, I, I searched on this and realized there's actually been several studies done, uh, medical studies, that there's actually during that time of teletalk or cuddling with your kid at night, there's actually a, a, what they call um, oxy, uh, oxytocin which is what they call love hormone. Literally, it makes the kid feel more love than you actually saying the words, I love you. Think about that. So it's this idea, again, we're portraying, we're to be image bearers as parents of, to the kids of the living God. And so what we're saying is, you deserve our time. You deserve our attention. You're, you're important. So it's this idea that you slow down. Now, I've got to wrap this up really quick, but this, where's the role of the church in this? Now, What's really cool about this is this. Um, when you look at Revelation, the last book in the Bible, the, the church is described as a lampstand. 
the lampstand in uh, the Levitical law and the process of the Holy of Holies and the holy place and all that, it laid in the holy place uh, next to um, the shoe, shoe bread. So let me read this real quick. One of the most intriguing details about the lampstand was there was a place next to the table that held the shoe bread, the loaves known as the bread of presence. The lampstand was positioned strategically to do one thing, cast its light on the table of the bread that represented God's provision and presence. The lampstand of the tabernacle stood to highlight the object that best represented God's goodness and provision. The same object that Jesus would one day uh, use to symbolize his own body. In other words, the church is to be the lampstand. It is to push Jesus and make Jesus famous to all the nations. We've said that the church is supposed to be, if you will, a picture perfect, if you will, neighborhood for the whole community. In other words, we're supposed to love each other unconditionally. We're to be one to another, love one another, pray for one another, care for one another, forgive one another. It's this idea that we're supposed to be an example for the world of what the church of Christ is supposed to look like. And the beautiful thing is we're to shine about, we're to shine Jesus. In other words, our main goal as a church should be to make Jesus famous. This is what the lampstand does. And so the church exists to shine a light into the darkness, a light that highlights God's goodness and reveals God's Son in order that the world can understand and know. So how do we do this? We've got the Shema, which is Deuteronomy 6. Talk about God when you wake up, when you go along, when you're on, in, in your home, when you go to sleep. We have the Great Commission. Uh, we go and make disciples, teaching them to obey everything that I've commanded you, right? Go and make, the, make disciples, baptize in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. This is this idea. We are supposed to go to the ends of the earth. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. So it's this idea. We have both the, the light of the world, okay, the church, and we have the heart of the kid coming together to make this beautiful marriage in making image bearers. That is what God commands us to do. So, do you realize the church is really to partner with the parents? We're not to replace the parents. The parents are the main disciples. Or in some cases, uh, those who um, have guardianship. Okay? But we're to come along and partner in that. So we want to partner as a church with you. As individuals, we have the Great Commission. So if you're here today and you're single and you don't have kids, say, how does this work? Great Commission. Guess what? You can be a part of partnering with families. There's people that need help because there's five significant others that need to be in a kid's life for their faith to stay past high school. So we need your help. The church needs your help. Families in this room need your help. So this is what God is calling us to do when he talks about numbering our days and live with wisdom. We need to focus on Jesus, living out and practicing the gospel in authentic faith. So I want to ask you this big question we leave today. This is it. If nothing's more important than a relationship with God, then what needs to change in my relationship with God, my family, and the church to make every week count? What needs to happen? Some of you are here today. You've been coming to church, but you haven't surrendered. Or maybe there's a time where that relationship with God was very on fire. Uh, it was stirred. Those kindles were stirred, and there was a roaring fire in your bones for a relationship with the Lord, but it has grown cold. Maybe there's been a season where you've just kind of walked away, and there needs to be repentance. Or maybe you're here today, and you're a parent, and you need help. Um, or you need to be challenged. You, you realize, I haven't been intentional with my time. I've just, I've let just to go with the flow, the, the way of the world just kind of sweep me down and I haven't been intentional with discipling my kids. You need prayer this morning. Listen, last week we talked about James, those who are sick and need to be anointed with oil and pray with. We'll do that, okay? Whatever you need, God is the answer today. Let me pray for you. There'll be people up front if you want to pray with or be prayed for, we want to encourage you today. Father, we thank you for our time today. Thank you for your word. God, I pray that as we go forward, God, we will be image bearers of you, God, that we will multiply. 
And God, advance your kingdom, Father. Do what only you can do. In Jesus' name, amen.